Well, hello. This is Amy Hutzel um, at the State Coastal Conservancy, and I want to thank you for joining us for this webinar on Californians' attitudes about the coast um, and uh, a special focus on barriers to coastal access and opportunities uh, to improve coastal access. <clears throat> so this is a follow-up to a webinar we held on July 11th, and during that webinar, um, Adam Probolsky presented a March 2017 statewide survey that the Conservancy had funded, and that all went very well. And then the internet went down in Oakland. Um, so today we're going to hear the rest of that planned webinar, as well as some new information. Uh, so we are first going to hear from John Christensen of UCLA about his research on coastal access, access issues. Um, from David Cordes at the Public Policy Institute of California about a recent statewide survey they conducted on environmental issues, including coastal uh, environmental issues, and from Adam Probolsky about some additional survey work that he has just recently conducted on, on coastal issues. So a couple housekeeping items before we begin. Um, all of the participants on this webinar are muted. If you have a question, uh, type it into the questions tab um, that you'll find on the webinar control panel on the right hand of your screen. And we'll answer them as we go along. And we'll also have time at the end of the webinar for Q&A. Uh, and we do plan <coughs> to post um, the slides used in this webinar, um, assuming the three presenters are OK with that. Um, so you don't have to write everything down. <clears throat> and we're also recording this web. Are we recording this webinar? Yes. Thank you. We are recording this webinar, so it'll be available to watch at your leisure, anytime you want, on our website. Uh, so now I'm going to turn it over to John Christensen uh, at UCLA to present his research. John worked with Phil King at San Francisco State University to conduct several different types of research, including intercept surveys, at Southern California beaches. Uh, they conducted a statewide survey of Californians. <clears throat> and they did research on Instagram use in parks in California. And John and Phil did this work with support from the Resources Legacy Fund. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to John. Thank you very much. And good morning, everybody. And thanks for those of you who are joining us again. Um, I, I uh, suspect that I, I, it, it goes without saying for most uh, everyone on this this call that uh, that that access for all is is important because it's enshrined in our state constitution um, and in the uh, uh, coastal act and the work of the coastal commission uh, and the conservancy and that our um, efforts were to uh, research what are the what are the the, the opinions and, and, and perceptions and attitudes of Californians um, uh, about the coast, but also what are their perceptions of um, the bar the barriers to coastal access. Um, next slide, please. So we conducted a statewide poll uh, in uh, last fall, uh, so about a year was it a, yes a year ago. Um, and in, in many of our, some of our questions anyway, you see do, replicating um, what uh, the PPIC and others have done, and we did that intentionally to, to measure where, how, how those attitudes are, are, are persisting or changing. And what we found really represent, does replicate previous polls showing that, that the vast majority of Californians from all regions of California uh, say that the condition of our ocean and beaches is important to them personally. Uh, between 83 and 90 percent, 94 percent of California voters. Next slide. This is uh, true across all kinds of gra demographics, and you'll see uh, in this presentation just some of the the Instagram photos that we also harvested, um, showing. Uh, the, the 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 joy and love of Californians um, at the coast, which we see over and over again reflected in, in the um, Instagram photos that, and, and sentiments um, that we har harvested, very positive attitudes. Next slide, please. So we um, we also conducted last summer um, a 
beach intercept surveys at uh, 11 Southern California beaches. So we uh, randomly sampled visitors to these beaches uh, during uh, the summer um, and surveyed over 1,100 beachgoers uh, at, at these at these 11 beaches and this map represents um, some of the place most of the places um, that they came from to visit the beach um, there's some off the map a, a few off the map but um, you'll see that they're, they're um, uh, from from around California clearly also co concentrated more closely to to the beaches um, but also uh, from the inland regions of uh, those coastal um, counties as well Next slide, please. So what we know from uh, many of us, I think, from, from visiting beaches is also reflected in these beach intercept surveys um, that um, you know, the California beaches um, can look very different in their demographic composition when you're at the beach. And so this is showing the um, different, uh, the ethnicity of the beach visitors that, that we sampled. And I would just point to um, two beaches that really show um, these uh, differences dramatically. Maybe I would first point out that Santa Monica Beach, which is right in the middle, is fairly closely uh, aligned with the demographic um, composition of California as a whole. Um, Dockweiler Beach, which is the beach, um, uh, state beach underneath the takeoff runways for Los Angeles International Airport. Um, it is uh, it, more uh, more uh, Hispanic, uh, Latino, uh, and African American, um, and in contrast to Doheny uh, Beach and and um, uh, farther south in Orange County, um, that is uh, more uh, white, fewer um, Hispanic, Latino, and and African Americans. Next slide, please. That uh, those differences are also reflected in the household income of, 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 of beach visitors. Again, if you look at Dockweiler um, in, in the middle there and compare it to Doheny, um, more, Dockweiler has more visitors from uh, families with lower household incomes. Uh, Doheny is, is uh, from much more visitors um, from households with higher incomes. Next slide, please. Now, in, in, in this, um, despite these differences um, uh, in the demographics of the beach visitors at different beaches, we found an overwhelming um, uh, consensus on what people want when they come to the beach. Uh, and you know, and that's re re reflected in, in this slide. People come to uh, enjoy the scenery or relax, um, so and so that their their children can play. And this is uh, you know across all demographic groups and all income groups, it's very consistent. We did not find statistically significant differences. Um, and then there's you know a, a wider variety of activities that people come to the beach uh, to do, from swimming and wading and walking and surfing, um, down you know to um, fishing and snorkeling and, and viewing marine life. Um, and then there are some minor differences in some of those things uh, across demographic groups. But again, what people want when they come to the beach is remark what they value is remarkably similar. Next slide, please. Just a reflection of the um, enjoying the scenery, relaxing with what, having a place where kids can play. Next slide, please. Now, this is um, uh, this this chart uh, re reflects you know what people want when they get to the beach, and and again we found um, you know and how important these amenities are to them when they get to the beach, and again we found remarkably uh, consistent results across all demographic groups, and really the the the, the scale here is um, you know up to five points. That's most important. So this. Uh, graph is going from least important to most important. So, looking at the looking at the bottom, um, couple of uh, people want clean sand. They want clean water. Um, they want some basic amenities like trash cans, restrooms, parking. Uh, and and it, it, interestingly, if we compare it, you know, to the the demographic differences that we um, saw. Um, 
in, in, in some of the beaches. People, people don't rank that as that's very important to see, uh, to see people from their own neighborhoods or communities or their own ethnic background. And anecdotally, we heard this a lot, that people, when they come to the beach, they want to see all kinds of people. They love to see all of California at the beach. Uh, next slide, please. So again, this is um, you know how important um, is the coast um, to you? We found this re remarkable similarity of, of people value the coast and they want similar things. They, they want the clean sand, clean water, a place to relax and enjoy the scenery and a place for their kids to play. Next slide. We did find um, some, some pretty significant differences between how often people visit the coast, where across California, about three quarters of, of people do visit the coast. Um, that dr drops off uh, fairly dramatically farther inland and in the Central Valley. Um, and, um, and, and distance and time are, 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 of course, big factors, along with the cost of staying overnight near the beach. Next slide, please. So in our, the statewide poll, we in, in investigated how uh, California voters ranked um, obstacles to coastal access. Again, again, we tried in these to replicate some previous studies um, and, you know, we've, we, uh, and, and, and add some, some new uh, information. And we found that, you know, people ranked affordable parking uh, and affordable overnight accommodations uh, as, as, as problems. Uh, public transit um, uh, as well by um, you know, close to 70% and then public access to the coast uh, by just over 60% public access in general. Um, this helped us sort of hone in on some of the questions we want to ask about affordability. Next slide, please. Uh, this, we, in, in, in uh, our beach intercept surveys, we use our beach intercept surveys to do what is called a travel cost model to calculate the value of trips to the beach um, based on how far people had traveled um, to come to the beach. Uh, it's a very standard model in, in recreational economics. Um, and we found that the average day trip had a total value of, of um, just about $37 with travel to the coast costing about uh, uh, um, $22. And I apologize for that the colors did not come across in these pie charts. Um, but what that shows is that there's a, for a day trip, there's a surplus of uh, $14.65. Um, and if parking or day use costs exceed that $15, many visitors, according to economists, might elect not to go to the beach. Um, with overnight trips, we found that the average overnight trip of four nights had a total value of um, just over $600 with the travel costing uh, close to $200, um, not including, including lodging, leaving a surplus of, of just over $400. And you can see more details of these analyses in our reports. But for the average stay of four nights, this leaves just over $100 a night for lodging. Um, and what, we'll, what we see in some of this research is really interesting in that it, it, you know, the, the numbers in this research and some other research are different, but they're, 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 they corroborate and they begin to give us a picture of you know, what that ballpark is for what average Californians believe you know, would be an affordable um, visit to the coast for them and what some of those obstacles to coastal, coastal access might be in terms of affordability. Next slide, please. What we know from research done by the California Coastal Commission is that um, the, 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 the availability of ho uh, economy hotel rooms uh, on the coast has uh, dramatically decreased uh, in the last um, several decades. Um, this, this graph represents the hotel rooms closed uh, in coastal counties up and down the coast at, in these different um, segments of the market. Next slide, please. So we also asked, um, we, we also use this research to try to get at um, who, who is it who's not visiting um, the coast or beach in California? If we looked a little more deeply at those, at who are, who's not coming to the beach among Californians and 18% 
of Californians um, uh, visit the Coaster Beach less than once a year, and five to seven percent of Californians never visit the coast. Um, these uh, these findings were were very closely replicated uh, by um, Adam Probolsky's um, research, uh, and this this slide combines a, a little bit of analysis from both of those surveys. Um, one out of five of those Californians uh, who don't visit the coast uh, live in, in the Central Valley. Um, half of them live in households with income under $60,000 a year, uh, and half of them are Latino, and half of them are foreign born. Um, and a third of them, interestingly, are, are unfamiliar with coastal amenities, and, which might give us a clue for kinds of information campaigns that might be useful and the demographics um, to target those to make uh, to, to, to welcome uh, these Californians and make sure they feel welcome to the coast. Next slide, please. This is a slide representing, uh, you know, asking of those people, why don't, don't you go to the beach more often? Um, the amount of time it takes to travel to the coast is the, the top one. Uh, friends and family uh, don't go to the coast or beach. Um, then the cost factors, um, uh, physical impairment, um, uh, lack of affordable uh, overnight options, and then um, things like, uh, you know, I, I can't swim, um, which actually turns out to be a significant factor, particularly for African American and um, Asian Pacific Islanders. Um, next slide, please. So we came up with some uh, some recommendations based on the, this research that um, you know uh, to include you know focusing legislative and ex executive branch attention on the beach and coast. Next slide. We can go through these pretty quickly. Changing the narrative on coastal access um, to be more inclusive. I, th I think we've begun to do that in in the in the last year. Increase the supply of low cost overnight accommodations. Uh, there's movement to do that, enhance public transportation options, and um, recognize the importance of affordable parking um, and to uh, sort of rationalize parking uh, costs and support groups that are changing the culture of access to the coast. The next slide um, illustrates some of those groups like Brown Girl Surf in Oakland, Cause and Oxnard Outdoor Outreach in San Diego. And the map that's underneath those pictures is uh, from our Instagram analysis where we looked at um, Instagram postings from parks all across California, um, including the more than a thousand public parks and beaches on the coast. And it's just to show how important those coastal uh, beaches and parks are within the whole um, network of parks that includes local, regional, state, and national parks in California. Um, next slide, please. Uh, to, you know, to, in this work to um, have a new generation passionate and engaged for the great coastal conservation uh, protection and access work that, the, that we've seen in the state of California over the last generation and more. Next slide, um, and this is uh, my contact information. This this uh, presentation will be posted, and there's more information also on our uh, on our website, including our full report. Thanks. Great, thank you, John. Um, huh? That was funny. Uh, <laughs> So we are now going to uh, turn it over to uh, David Cordes. Um, he's a research associate at the Public Policy Institute of California, where he works on the PPIC statewide survey. Um, before joining PPIC, he was a survey operations analyst at NORC at the University of Chicago. And he has also worked on election campaigns as a data manager and analyst. And um, he's going to be presenting uh, a fairly recent uh, statewide survey that uh, PPIC conducted of, of Californians. Um, so, David, are you you're there? Yes, I am. Thank you. Okay. okay. Great. It's, Great. Um, it's good to talk with you all. Thank you for having me. And thanks, John. That was really useful information. It's interesting to see how that interacts with some of the PPIC findings that we'll look at in a moment. Um, so yeah, this was a survey on Californians and the environment that we conducted in July of this year. Um, it is 
the 17th annual survey on environmental issues that we've done at PPIC, and this one um, was for the first time in about 10 years that we really took a close look at ocean and coastal issues. So today I'm going to focus on those questions, and I'm also going to pull out a few other topics that have kind of an ocean and coastal um, connection or question or angle on them, and we'll look at those too. So first, just to give you a little detail on the survey, again, it was conducted for about a week and a half during the middle of July. These are all telephone interviews. Um, we talked about 1,700 California adults, and we did interviews in English or Spanish, depending on the uh, preference of the respondent. Um, so getting right into the findings here, um, as John mentioned, there's this kind of question that we've asked a couple times and others have asked before, and this is how important is the condition of the ocean and beaches the, uh, to you personally? And here, you know, similar findings, again, it's a, nearly everybody says it's important, and you can see among adults, it's about 7 in 10 saying it's very important to them, um, the condition of ocean and beaches to them personally. And Looking across the state, um, you know, it's, it's large majorities everywhere. You can see there's a little bit of a difference between inland and coastal counties in the importance of the ocean and beaches to, to people. But even inland residents, two and three, are saying it's very important to them personally. Um, and here on the chart, you can see across age groups also that those under 35 are more likely than older adults to say it's very important to them personally. We asked a similar question, which was not about you, but of how important is it to the state's economy and quality of life. And overall, the findings were pretty similar. Again, nearly everybody says this is important for the state, um, with about 7 in 10 saying very important. But on that question, we don't see the regional differences. We don't see the same kind of differences between the age groups. So, you know, you do see that when it's about how important is it to you personally, but asking about for the state. There's that kind of recognition across the state, and across age groups. We also asked about uh, frequency of visits. And you know, where John was kind of focusing on those who don't visit, I'll show you in a moment a little bit of a breakdown of those who do visit most frequently. Here are the overall findings. It's about 7 in 10 saying they visit a beach along the California coast at least several times a year, including over a third who say that they visit at least once a month. And again, the details on those, here you can see um, among, these are looking at people who visit at least once a month. 45% uh, of those in coastal counties saying they're visiting a, a beach on the coast at least once a month, um, compared to 19% of those living inland. And again, similar to that importance to yourself, we see that younger people are more likely to be visiting uh, most frequently. About half say that they're visiting at least once a month. And then looking across um, income groups, it's higher income, you know, wealthier Californians, most likely to say that they're visiting a beach at least once a month. Um, on this one, we found uh, for this high frequency group, similar results across uh, racial and ethnic groups. We also asked about a few perceptions of a few problems. Um, first, this is ocean and beach pollution along the California coast. And about 8 in 10 say that beach pollution is a big problem, uh, with you know just under half, 46%, saying it's a big problem. It's the youngest adults, um, those 18 to 34, most likely to say it's a big problem. Um, which you see on the chart here. Comparing inland and coastal residents, those opinions are similar. They're about equally likely to say that pollution is a problem. On this question is where we start to see the kind of partisan differences, um, where we have half of Democrats and independents saying that ocean and beach pollution is a big problem, and about a third are Republicans, so fewer Republicans saying that. I mentioned we have done these environmental surveys for a while, and this is the first time we've gone back to the ocean and coastal questions. We last asked about this in 2006, and the findings were actually pretty similar. So no change in what we found in perceptions of ocean and beach pollution over the past 11 years. We asked a few more kind of um, problem questions. Here is uh, let's go a quick summary of three of them. We asked about the contamination of fish and seafood, about declining marine life, and then just one question about limited public access to the coast and beaches. And the chart on the left, you can see um, responses on the fish and seafood and marine life are pretty similar, and also similar to what we found for um, ocean and beach pollution, which is about 8 in 10 saying it's a problem and just under half saying it's a big problem. And the same kind of partisan breaks on that one, where for the fish and seafood and declining, declining marine life, it's about half of Democrats and independents saying it's a big problem, and about a third of Republicans saying that. Um, 
question. Where we do see a difference is when we ask about limited public access. Fewer call that a problem. Um, altogether, it's about half saying that that access to the coast and beaches is a problem. And again, we just asked this one question, so it's nice to see that that John had a series of kind of the different problems and, and how people perceive that. It's nice to kind of flesh this out a little bit with that. Um, on our question, it was those living in Orange County and San Diego and um, those with highest incomes, which you can see on the chart on the right, who were least likely to say that this was a problem. Um, and if you recall, it was those with higher incomes were also, we found the most likely to be visiting beaches frequently. So they're visiting most frequently and least likely to say that access is a problem, which kind of makes sense. Oh, uh, one thing I'll mention more on this in the slide is the our responses that we got on these contamination questions, the contamination of fish and seafood, and, and um, oh yeah, that one and pollution. Those were the ones that were similar back to, to 2010. The others, I think, were new questions. So moving on, um, we asked very broadly about the state's marine protected areas, which are managed by the State Fish and Game Commission to protect fish, wildlife, and their habitats. And about three and four say that it's very important that the state has these. And you can see on this chart, while there are some differences across parties, it's, it's majorities across parties saying that it's very important that the state has these MPAs. And across regions of the state, it's about three and four saying it's very important. So that's the specific coastal and ocean questions we have. As I mentioned, I'm going to touch on a few other issues because this survey we did was, you know, covered environmental issues broadly, but there are some kind of coastal connections which we'll look at. So first, um, the state water supply. Here's a chart. You can see what we've been tracking. Um, we asked people if the supply of water is a problem in their part of the state. And you can see the big dramatic spike of that dark blue line of people saying it's a big problem where, you know, that was much higher during the drought years. And it dropped down when we asked again in July, um, where we had 62% of adults saying that their local water supply was a big problem. Um, I'm sorry, 62% said that last year. It's down to 37% uh, this year. So a big drop. And that 37% is similar to where it was back in 2012. Um, it's still notable, though, that today, with the drought officially over, we still have over 6 in 10 saying that their water supply is at least somewhat of a problem. So that perception is still out there. Now, related to this, we asked about support for building desalination plants. And on this, we found two and three adults and two and three likely, voter, likely voters in favor of building desalination plants on the coast. Um, that's up from 56% when we last asked that question in 2006. Um, today, we found over six and 10 among Democrats, among Republicans, independents, and really across regions of the state, across age groups, income groups, over six and 10 saying they favored building desalination plants. So, you know, this was, I think, maybe a surprise to us to see that that number had gone up. And it's one of those questions where, um, since we, you know, we only have time to squeeze in one here, it really, it has us intrigued to go back and look at this issue a little bit more and see, you know, maybe ask how much people know about desalination or ask a question that kind of has some trade-offs and see if that support level drops down. But really what we found here is just, you know, with providing no information about it, just this very broad question. And two and three say they're in favor of the idea. One other subject i uh, touch on is climate change. Um, first, I'll just show you here is a question we've been asking for a while, which is how, how serious of a threat is global warming to the state's economy and quality of life? And over half of adults and likely voters say it's a very serious threat. At least half have said so in our surveys going back um, about three years. And uh, here you can see on the chart we're looking across racial and ethnic groups. Latinos are most likely to say that it's a serious threat, and uh, whites are least likely to say that. Here again, there's those partisan differences. It's over two and three Democrats, about half of independents saying um, climate change is a very serious threat, and just a quarter of Republicans saying that. Uh, now, we also asked specifically about the threat of sea level rise. And on this, what we found overall was about a third um, say that they're very concerned about rising sea levels, about a third are somewhat concerned, and then the remaining third are not concerned about rising sea levels. And here again are those differences across parties, where you have a lot of Democrats very concerned about three in 10 independents, and 13% of Republicans saying they're very concerned about rising sea levels. Um, looking at regions of the state, 
not a huge difference, but but those living on the coast are somewhat more likely than those living inland um, to say they're concerned about rising sea levels. And the last issue that I'll cover here is um, renewable energy, and, and again, there's a kind of a coastal angle on this, which we'll see. But first, we asked a couple questions. One was about um, a goal that the legislature was considering, but ultimately did not pass to have the state on 100% renewable electricity by the year 2045. And we found you know, very broad support across groups for that goal. Here, these are the light blue bars. You can see it's over seven in 10 adults and likely voters in favor of the state setting that 100% renewable goal. Um, and that includes over six in 10 across regions and across the demographic groups we look at, and even majorities across parties here in favor of 100% um, renewable goal. Now in gray, uh, the gray bars on here is a, a different question we asked, which was not about the goal specifically, but just in general saying, would you be willing to pay more for electricity that came from renewable sources in order to fight climate change? And there we found about half um, say that they would be willing to pay more. Again, we're not saying necessarily means you pay more, but just if it came to that, you know, would you be willing to pay more? Um, so again, about half saying so. And you can see the kind of comparisons between the support for the general goal and um, the willingness to pay more. Where you still have a majority of Democrats saying that they would be willing to pay more, but for Republicans, whereas you've got a majority in support of that goal, it's only 30% saying they'd be willing to pay more. So now looking uh, specifically at some energy sources, here is our trend line when we ask about more oil drilling off of the coast of California. And you can see we had a record low in support for um, oil drilling off the coast in this year's survey. It was actually an 11 point drop in support since just a year ago, which was interesting because um, that the number uh, of previous low points had been after I think the, the Deepwater Horizon spill and, uh, and the uh, spill off the Santa Barbara coast and then this year without there being you know some big spill like that we, we, we had our lowest point in support for offshore, offshore drilling. Um, looking across the state it's fewer than a third across all the regions of the state in favor of more drilling off the coast and while those in inland counties are slightly more likely than those in the coast in favor it's still fewer than a third again in any region in favor. Um, and then the, the final thing we look at is we can compare the support for um, drilling with support for renewable sources. Um, so we asked about building or allow, allowing wind and wave energy projects off the California coast. And this was a new question, the first time we asked about this. And you can see uh, these are the dark gray bars show support for wind and wave energy compared to the light blue for the more oil drilling. So clearly a really big difference there. We found three and four adults and likely voters in favor of wind and wave energy projects off the coast. And again, similar support across parties, which is in contrast to the differences in support for drilling, which you can again see in blue. Um, for the renewable projects, it was at least seven in 10 among inland and coastal residents and more support among younger adults for these, but really it's, it's still about two and three, regardless of the age group that you're looking at. So that's everything I wanted to share. Let me just kind of summarize that quickly to wrap up uh, what we looked at. Again, nearly all Californians say that the condition of the oceans and beaches is important to the state and also when we ask about um, how important is them personally. Uh, looking at frequency of visits to the coast, younger and wealthier adults are the most likely to, to visit most frequently, those who said that they visit at least once a month. Um, when we asked about perceptions of problems, majority said that ocean pollution and contamination of seafood were a problem, um, but fewer said that access or limited access to the coast was a big problem. And looking at cross groups, the wealthiest adults were the least likely to say that access was a big problem. And finally, uh, as we just saw that there was strong majorities in support of the ideas of uh, both desalination plants and wind and wave energy. And again, those I think are questions that we'd like to follow up on with some more detail because we saw this big uh, Numbers, big numbers of support for it, but without us really getting into much detail on the question. So I think that's something that would be worth exploring a bit more. Um, so yeah, I'd be happy to take your questions later on, but uh, for now, happy to turn over the mic. Thanks. Great, right. thank you so much. Um, I'm not, I don't see any questions. Um, so we're gonna um, turn it over to Adam Probolski in a moment. Uh, I would point out, and he's gonna, yeah. Sorry. Um, Adam presented um, his statewide 
survey results from um, March of 2017 um, at our July 11th webinar. Um, and if you want to see that, that um, presentation, it is available on our website. Uh, the webinar is, is there. If you have trouble finding it, feel free to email me or, or Liz. Um, and we can send you the link. Um, at this point, Adam's going to present um, hot off the presses uh, survey results. And Adam is with Probolsky Research. Uh, they do work for a wide array of clients um, from Restore Hetch Hetchy to Lennar to City of Newport Beach and the Coastal Conservancy. So um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Adam. Thank you very much, Amy. Uh, so, as Amy explained, we did research kind of similar to John Christensen uh, and to some degree PPIC on coastal access and barriers in the last uh, last year and early this year. And so, I feel like the results I'm about to present are kind of novelty questions, substantive, important, but maybe a little more fun uh, for us anyway. Um, so, uh, I want to do a little bit of discussion about methodology to make sure everybody knows how we did this. Um, in this case, we talked to voters, uh, and uh, which is different than I think, the last one. Uh, we actually also injected the opportunity for people to respond online, which we believe uh, you know, prevents method bias uh, to some degree. And uh, we talked to people on landlines, uh, on their cell phones, uh, which turned out to be majority, 63% were on mobile phones. Um, and then also offered uh, Spanish as an option and, and about 6% of the California voter population chose to participate in Spanish. Um, so that's the, the, the background. And getting right into the top issues, we ask an open-ended question at the beginning of our poll, all our polls to identify you know, what's most important, what's pressing in people's community. Uh, this is kind of a word cloud that, that illustrates the words, the intensity of the words people use, and clearly housing homelessness. You see that a bit there. Um, and this is how it categorizes down. Homelessness and poverty uh, it, you know, is the top issue. And interestingly enough, uh, this, this is a theme that carries uh, through a lot of California on a more regional basis, on a local basis. So whether you're polling in Oakland or in Orange County, uh, homelessness, and, homelessness and poverty uh, and right underneath that affordable housing are, are basically in similar positions. Um, what's not on this list is coastal access or uh, you know beach quality ocean quality and you wouldn't necessarily expect that because it's just not uh, the, the most important thing to people but you know, there are things like environmental uh, and water and things like that lower on down so um, if we're all focused on on coastal access and beach quality and things like that uh, we got to remember that not everybody else is um, looking next uh, we had a question that uh, I think was similar to what David Cordes had with PPIC, but a little bit different and probably a little more hard hitting. Um, meaning, you know, it, it kind of perhaps uh, evoked some more emotion. Uh, and in this case, we asked, do you think that sea level ri uh, rising sea levels will disrupt the life as we know it in California during your lifetime? Uh, that's a pretty, um, uh, it, it's pretty, a pretty harsh question, quite frankly. It's one that makes people choose whether it's going to really change things in a dramatic way. And clearly a plurality says yes, but uh, um, a big chunk, 42%, say no. We chose to break this down by a few different factors. First by gender. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, men say no majority and women, bigger majority, say yes. You can see kind of the cliche that we'll see uh, come up a few times here that Republicans broadly say no and Democrats broadly say yes. Uh, and then um, you, you can see it by age as well. And younger uh, voters uh, say uh, yes. And as you cascade, as you get older, uh, they say no. And, and that may be uh, one of two things, either a um, uh, the idea that they don't think that uh, rising sea levels are a factor, or they just might think that they're not going to see it because they're not going to live that long. Um, so looking then at uh, looking at it by uh, north-south counties, uh, north counties say yes, southern counties barely say no, and then 
uh, coastal counties, uh, majority yes, and inland counties, uh, almost in the majority, plurality say no. Um, so uh, next we had, a, a, I think, a, a very interesting question that essentially identifies what kind of overnight stay accommodations are in the consideration set for uh, for Californians. And we, what, what is not on this list is hotels, and part of the reason is we, we kind of know the answer um, to that question from our previous research. We just wanted to identify these alternate uh, ways of, of staying overnight at the coast. Uh, and what's interesting is uh, short-term rentals like Airbnb and Home Away is is far away the number one uh, answer, but it actually is uh, not. It's pretty low on the, the 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 numbers as far as where people would typically stay or, or have stayed uh, at the coast. So you know, absent that hotel environment, uh, they're kind of choosing something as as choosing to try to basically replicate the hotel environment as close as they can. A majority is anyway. Um, and obviously they were able to choose more than one here to, to give them the option of all that they would put in their consideration set. You know, camping indoors, as you can see, in a cabin or cottage or bunkhouse is number two. You know, outside camping uh, would be number three. And, and uh, RVs, partly because of there's a greater barrier to actually acquiring one or renting one versus just showing up uh, at the other uh, venues. So we broke these numbers down by gender. Uh, you'll see kind of similar formations here, camping indoors at the top, camping outside, then RV, then short-term rental, and none. So short-term rental, you know, kind of sticking out there. Uh, not a dramatic difference by gender. Um, by party, uh, you have, uh, uh, you know, basically a little bit of a, um, of a bump there for RVing. Uh, that's, you know, we probably could all kind of guess that. Uh, and then uh, no other real major differences. By age, um, you know, also you, you see kind of a similar formation here, uh, you know, short-term rentals being a, a bigger factor for some of the uh, maybe 30 to 39, things like that. So uh, household income, uh, probably not a surprise again that, that uh, short-term rentals are a bigger factor for uh, higher income earners uh, and a uh, less of a slightly less factor for uh, lower income earners preferring other methods, but uh, not again, dramatic differences. Um, north, south, again, similar formation. Um, so, and then coastal and, and, um, and inland counties, similar formation, nothing dramatic difference. Uh, so this one is kind of, I think the ultimate novelty question, which is, uh, you know, a policy question that who knows if it ever could actually happen, but something that we wanted to test. The idea that the state would purchase and operate motels and small hotels near the coast and offer some sort of uh, modified pricing that was affordable to uh, California residents. Um, and and I, I'm not suggesting that this is, like I said, something that's right on the table and somebody's ready to roll with it, but it's, it's I think, an idea that's out there, and so we wanted to identify whether there was support for it or not. Um, we've got basically 50% supported and, and uh, 37, 37% we round up oppose. And there's some interesting numbers based upon the uh, demographics. Um, men marginally oppose it, uh, but women broadly, uh, you know, supermajority basically uh, supports it. And uh, no surprise, Republicans kind of have a, a preference against let's say government interaction so or intervention. So there's a, a plurality of Republicans who oppose it, although a big chunk that support it. And then a, a, a sizable majority of Democratic voters uh, that support and, and kind of mixed results with independents. Um, and you can see broadly age group wise their support uh, until you get to, to 65 and older and, and they oppose the idea. Uh, breaking it down by county, uh, north-south, and then by inland and, and uh, coastal, there's a, a, a preference uh, in support uh, of the um, of the idea, and and that's the uh, the extent of it. Um, there's a lot more data behind this, uh, based on uh, income and and uh, and all kinds of other data that we're happy to um, happy to share. 
uh, as Amy said, I think the, this information will be posted on their website, and I'll try to post it on ours. Uh, please reach out with, with any other questions, because we can really slice and dice the data that might be more relevant to you or your agency. Great. Thank you so much, Adam. Um, and yeah, there are qu a couple questions. And OK, so Conservancy staff had a question, and John responded to that. And then Angela asked if we could have the links or names of all these reports. And we will, we will do that. We um, can't put them right in there in the answer, but I will make sure that that happens. Before um, I summarize um, some of the stuff that the Conservancy is doing to address these issues, um, we did want to show um, a very short video from the focus groups that we did with Adam back in um, November and December of 2016. And these are um, three clips, two from the downtown Los Angeles focus group and one from um, our Long Beach um, focus group. Um, and we were going to show this in the last webinar, but, but weren't able to. We did uh, six focus groups um, throughout the state, uh, mostly Southern California, one in Fresno, one in San Jose. Um, so we have nine hours of video and transcripts from these uh, focus groups, and it's, it's really uh, interesting to look through, and we are uh, continuing to pull uh, quotes and clips. Uh, from these focus groups um, uh, on various coastal access topics. Uh, and with that, let's just, we'll watch this video. As a teacher, I think about um, taking kids on field trips, and aside from Cabrillo Beach and from um, the aquarium, I can't think of one educational facility that's uh, specifically for mm. school children. So that would be a lovely thing to have. I just remember looking again to the days and media weekends, so affordable lodging near the shoreline, the coastline, um, convenient transportation, and educational attractions for my kids with our business. <laughs> you know, so if you want to come back. <laughs>
bus, trains, public transit options from Central Valley and economically depressed communities avail available. Consider some weekdays and weekends be a lower cost option. Support swim programs in these areas and field trips could encourage a practice of safety and knowledge. Other ground up solutions may prove more economic and with greater impact. And I think that's a great um, that's a great comment and, and question. It's got a number of things in there that um, you know the conservancy is trying uh, to support. And obviously, there's a question of you know scale. We've got I think 39 million um, Californians at this point. So you know how much can we um, move the needle in terms of of supporting um, public transit? Um, but we are, through our Explore the Coast grant program, um, annually supporting um, education and interpretation programs that um, get people to the coast and enhance their experience when they're there. And we do really try to focus on underserved audiences. So that could be, you know, inland California, um, uh, people with disabilities, um, um, school children, especially in lower income communities. So I think we are um, uh, doing this work, but of course, you know, it could be um, at a much greater scale. Okay, and then a question about the surveys. Did any of the three surveys find significant differences between more urban and more suburban agricultural counties? I think that's a question for John and Adam and um, David, if any of you have thoughts on that. Yeah, I think this is John, and I, I, I mean, I do think you can see that there are um, differences and, and, and significant differences between um, the coastal counties and the inland counties, and I think all of us know in California you know, that those, those differences are there, um, and I think, you know, some of those have to do um, certainly with more urban and more suburban or, or agricultural um, character of those counties. Um, it, it would be, it would take more work than, than and, and you know, with a, with a larger sample, I think, than we have to really know um, to what extent those differences are among residents of those more uh, of the more urban parts of some of those counties that are more suburban and agricultural, if that makes sense. I mean, to distinguish between urban and rural residents, um, we didn't do we didn't do that. Uh, this is Adam Probalski. I, I, I think the answer is yes. But the, the biggest driving factors of relationship to the coast uh, and differences are, are certainly proximity, uh, I think income, and then uh, also access. And, and, it, it, and I don't mean access in that, you know, there's a trail to the coast, but the ability to get there, and that kind of goes back to income and or, you know, some sort of, uh, you know, geographic impediment. Um, it, and it goes back to some of our earlier research uh, that talks about um, not having the time to, to go. And, and I think that goes back to things like income uh, as well. Yeah, I would um, echo what John said about, I think that was John, about the kind of needing a bigger sample to kind of distinguish between, you know, urban and, and suburban. One thing that stood out on, on the John's maps, which I thought was interesting, was if I saw that right, it looked like even along the coast, um, there was greater perception of importance in kind of the Bay Area and around LA than uh, in other counties. So, did I see that right? Yeah, I think you did. Yes, I think that's correct. Great. Well, I'm going to um, I'm going to just summarize some of what the Con Coastal Conservancy is doing um, to start addressing uh, these issues. And if there are additional questions, feel free to um, to type them in. Obviously, the the Coastal Conservancy and Coastal Commission uh, have worked for over 40 years to open up public access to the coast of California, creating access ways, trails, and stairways, uh, working to complete 
the California Coastal Trail, and working with a lot of different partners up and down the coast, local governments, nonprofits, and others, to provide visitor serving amenities such as restrooms, parking lots, and visitor centers. So we're continuing to do this um, important work um, with the Commission, but we're also interested in better understanding uh, some of these fundamental barriers to coastal access for Californians. Um, and this research uh, has been really uh, useful for us in thinking about um, you know, those barriers that start really in people's homes, in their communities, when they're, when they're you know, thinking about um, uh, a coastal trip, a coastal vacation, uh, long before they get to you know, the access way actually leading from their car. Um, down to the beach. And some of these barriers include the cost of staying at the coast uh, overnight, the challenges to getting to the coast, or limited access to information about uh, coastal recreation. Um, there, is, um, there are two pieces of legislation that have just passed through the legislature and are both on the governor's desk now. Um, one is AB 250 which re would require the Coastal Conservancy to work with state parks, the Coastal Commission, and others to produce a low-cost overnight accommodations plan for Coastal California. Um, and it has a, a, a number of things that we will need to do, including identifying existing stock of affordable lodging and opportunities to provide additional lower-cost accommodations. Um, and that includes on, um, on public land. Um, so assuming this legislation is signed by the governor, the Conservancy plans to have um, this report produced in 2018. And a lot of this research and other research we've been doing, we've worked with um, Sustaneer to actually be collecting data about existing um, accommodations uh, on the coast, will feed into uh, this plan. And then SB5, is a $4 billion parks and water bond um, that if the governor signs would go to the voters um, in June of 2018 on the ballot in California. Uh, and out of that $4 billion, there is $60 million for low cost overnight accommodations. Um, 30 million would go to state parks for work on their lands, so on state parks along the coast. And state parks do make up um, a third of the California coast, so it's a significant portion of, of our coast. And then $30 million to the Coastal Conservancy to distribute via grants and contracts for low-cost overnight accommodation. So we could be working with, with other entities, um, county uh, parks departments, cities, nonprofits, um, to support uh, lower-cost overnight accommodation. Uh, the bond also has significant additional funds for coastal conservation and access projects uh, generally, um, and it has a significant focus on, on supporting disadvantaged communities and park poor communities. So assuming this is signed by the governor and passed by the voters, funds would uh, likely be available starting in fiscal year 1920, and the state's fiscal year starts July 1st. So it's still a ways off, but um, we've got the, the plan to work on um, over the next year and then um, potentially funding to implement the plan. And then the Conservancy is also in the midst of updating our strategic plan, and the draft strategic plan includes goals and objectives related to coastal access, the coastal trail, lower cost overnight accommodations, our Explore the Coast grant program. Um, and that plan, the draft plan's on our website now, and we're taking public comments through October 16th. So I encourage you to, to read it and uh, submit comments. And with that, let's see, do, no, great. Well, with that, um, I really want to thank our three speakers, um, Adam and John and David, uh, for taking the time to do this and, and for their um, really great research um, in, on coastal access issues and on coastal conservation um, generally. And I want to thank all of you for participating. 
and we will get the information out to you about um, where this webinar is posted, where the previous webinar is posted, where the reports are, and uh, where the slides are. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, thanks.